Moani nonke, siabak makala kubami, redistanes vanin vande chutse lande in Africa. Africa borwa, here we Or, hello everyone, welcome to my history of one of the largest countries in Africa, South Africa. I just went through four of its national languages. Osa, yes, there's clicks in that language, you'll, you'll be hearing some more of that in this video. Zulu, Afrikaans, and Sutu, showing how crazy South Africa as a nation is. They have over 10 national languages. Anyways, let's begin. In 1994, in the Stichwantran Caves in North Central South Africa, near Johannesburg, a skeleton was found. Named Littlefoot, it proved to be one of the oldest and most complete skeletons ever found in Africa. It was also very old, like Dick Van Dyke old, at three and a half million years old, by a landslide making it the oldest skeleton ever found in South Africa. In 1925, Raymond Duart discovered an infant skeleton which was named the Town Child. It was determined that it was a member of the Australopithecus species and was 2.8 million years old. Raymond's discovery gives us an important look into the life of the Australopithecus species. In 2008, at the Molapa Cave in northern South Africa, a series of fossils were found. They were members of the Australopithecus sediba species and were dated at 1.7 million years old. What's hilarious about these fossils is how they got in that cave. 1.7 million years ago, a group of this species that were probably brain dead wandered around the land above and eventually fell 150 feet down a sinkhole to their deaths. So yeah, that's fun. From 75,000 BCE to 36,000 BCE, many hominids, likely including the sun, which still exists today as most ancient people on the planet and are one of the few people groups outside of East Asia to have epicanthic folds, which you can say makes you have narrower eyes, flocked to what became known as the Sabudu Cave. Here, they did whatever prehistoric people did, like, I don't know, cause other species to go extinct and also die. After, it was left abandoned, eventually to be discovered by people building houses nearby. Between 2000 BCE and 100 BCE was one of the largest and most important migrations in history. The migration of Harry and Meghan to California. No, the Bantu migration. During this migration, many people of the native Bantu group migrated from Western Africa southeast, ending up in what are now countries like South Africa. The largest effect this still has on the people of South Africa today is through their languages. The Bantu began the construction of what would become the languages of Nosa, which yes has clicks in the letters X, Q, and sometimes I, the Sutu, Zulu, and arguably Swana languages. The, these languages are still regularly spoken today and are recognized as languages in South Africa. Between roughly 50 BCE and 350 were the establishment of South Africa's first agriculture communities of people. In them, cattle would be raised for meat and crops would be grown, which is kind of odd for farming, you know. Later, between 700 and 900 was a period of cooling, which was both good and bad for the populace living in what is now South Africa. In 1075, the kingdom of Mokungubwe was founded. It was founded by members of the Shona tribe, who trespassed over the border from what is now Zimbabwe and was the first kingdom in southern Africa as a whole. In the capital of the kingdom of Mokungubwe, called Mokungubwe Hill, life and society was unique. There was a loose monarchy, farms, and so, so, so many pots, as well as figurines like the famous golden rhino of Mokungubwe, which became a symbol of South Africa centuries later. At its height, in roughly 1115, there were about 5,000 people, which was astronomical for the time. However, after a depletion of resources in the area, the kingdom of Mokungubwe fell apart in 1300. In 1488, the first European oh, to sail next to South Africa did just that. This European explorer was Bartholomo Diaz, who was here to find a trade to what is now Indonesia for spices. Later on, he arrived at what is now Cape Town on the Cape of Good Hope, naming it Cabo de Juan Montas, or the Cape of Storms, something that was pretty accurate for local tide patterns. He faded into obscurity after, letting one of the most famous Portuguese explorers to take off where he left off. Arriving off the coast of South Africa in November of 1497 was one of the most famous explorers in history, Vasco da Gama. In 1497, the Gama and his crews arrived at the Cape of Good of Hope and kept sailing eastward. 
ending up at the Great Fish River. He named the region Natal since he got there on Christmas, and Natal is Portuguese for Christmas. Today, one of the South African states is called KwaZulu Natal, and has Natal in, its, Natal in its name because you know. After this, he left in favor of exploring Tanzania, which I made a whole video on. On June 18th, 1580, Sir Francis Drake of England arrived at the Cape of Good Hope and said, This cape is the most stately thing and the first cape we saw in the whole circumference of the earth. Because, you know, someone had to. Not much happened until 1652, which is when a new European group arrived. The Dutch. In 1652, the or the Dutch East India Company built a permanent town in what is now Cape Town, making it a pivotal stop in the Cape Route to South Asia for spices. After this, also in 1652, the Dutch established the Cape Colony, the first colony in South Africa. It would promote slavery and other bad things. From 1713 to 1755, there was a large smallpox outbreak that devastated the colonists and the natives alike. However, the Cape Colony didn't see the person knocking at its door. In 1795, the Dutch's Cape Colony was invaded in an event that is now called the Battle of Moisenburg. By 1808, these invaders had conquered the entire Cape Colony. Who must it be? The British! After conquering the Dutch, the British were pretty reassured, thinking they were the only ones alone. However, the British weren't the only ones in South Africa. East of their domain lay the land of the warrior king known as the Napoleon of Africa. In 1818, the Zulu Empire was founded by infamous warrior king Shaka Zulu, and the Zulu weren't about to suck up to the British yet. After a series of conquests, Shaka Zulu's health rapidly began to deteriorate, and on September 22, 1828, Shaka Zulu was assassinated by two of his brothers named Dengani and Malanga after they thought he was going mentally insane. Nothing really happened in the reign of his brother, King Dengani, who was also assassinated, or his successor, King Mpande, who, by his death in 1872, had 16 wives, which reminds me of, nope, not going there. In 1873, the last of the so-called Great Zulu Kings, Shetshwayo, became king. King Shetshwayo's first act as king was a declare war on the British. Fair enough. This began the Anglo-Zulu War. In 1879, the Anglo-Zulu War was fought, leading to the deaths of 1,000 British people and 3,000 Zulus. By far a British victory, causing the fall of the Zulu Empire. While we were talking about war... Following the Wichwaterschand gold rush that created Johannesburg in 1886, pressure was building. That pressure was between the leftover Dutch settlers called the Boers and the British. This pressure was released in the Boer War, which you can call the second most controversial event in South African history. From 1889 to 1901, 20,000 British and 6,000 Boers were killed. During this war, the British enacted the construction of several appalling concentration camps for the Boers, which some mortifying events happened in it. Yeah, the UK has done some sickening things in history. In 1910, the British unified the four Boer republics as well as their own colonies into one colonial state, the Union of South Africa. After doing this, World War I broke out in Europe for other reasons, and later World War II would be fought too. Combined, 18,000 South Africans died in these two wars. However, this trend of suffering would only continue. In 1948, after the white minority National Party took over in South Africa, the darkest period in South African history, and the elephant in the room began, the apartheid era. From 1948 to 1994, the Union of South Africa would be ruled by a racist white minority government, which implemented a system called apartheid which segregated people by race, saw the excessive use of force by police against non-whites, and restrictions on human rights to those not of European descent. However, this luckily wouldn't last. On May 10th, 1994, the most famous South African in history came to its presidency as its first president, Nelson Mandela. During his presidential term, going from 1994 to 1999, Mandela lifted South Africa from the apartheid era, establishing it as a modern, democratic nation free of racism. On February 15, 2018, 
Cyril Ramaphosa became the fifth president of South Africa under the African National Congress Party. And there was my history of South Africa. Now for part two of the video, the National Anthem of South Africa. I now present my cover of the South African National Anthem known as Nokasikalele Africa or God Bless Africa. It has five languages in it. Nosa, Zulu, Sasutu, Afrikaans, and English in that order. Enjoy one of the most beautiful national anthems in my opinion. Here it is. that that was my history and cover of the national anthem of south africa thanks so much for watching yes it got dark like really dark at points but in the end of the day south africa remains a great and free nation my next video will be not on a country a place or a person my next video will be on one of the most famous events in history the vietnam war coming out on april 30th thanks for watching